The following is a presentation of TFNN. The Morning Markets Kickoff with your host, Tommy O'Brien. Now, Tommy O'Brien. Good morning, everyone. This is Jacob filling in for Tommy O'Brien. I'll be with you uh, for a little while now over the next week. Let's take a look at what we have going on right now. Of course, we are kind of pre-open right now. Uh, we have the ES Mini, so the SP Futures down just about 0.77, the NQs down about 1.30, the Dow Futures down 0.25%. We have gold up marginally. We'll talk a little bit about gold uh, today. Uh, it's interesting with it staying at the price level it is, especially with such a large gap up in the dollar. A lot of the times they're inversely uh, related. Now we have silver down marginally as well, about 1% at 2328. Copper also down. We'll talk about oil as well. There's a lot of things going on right in crude. Last time I was with you, we were looking at uh, Saudi Arabia and they are keeping that 1 million barrels per day restriction that they imposed on themselves. Um, they're going to continue that throughout the rest of the year. That obviously sent uh, a lot of prices skyrocketing. Um, and it was a difficult time for that to happen as well. Uh, there's obviously some kind of geopolitical pressure going on regarding that. Uh, the U.S. is at, uh, I don't want to say historically lows, but, but very low reserve uh, for oil. So they need, we need to essentially add more into our reserves. Uh, people are using more and more energy across the nation as it's uh, been a pretty significantly hot uh, year. However, you have some sluggishness in the Chinese sector, um, and that kind of is a depressing factor on oil prices as well. So we kind of saw oil pull back. Uh, you know, this is the light, sweet crude futures, um, but we saw a little bit of a pullback, uh, nothing too significant. And of course, a major jump up uh, from 86, around 86, uh, 21. So it stands to see really where future, uh, excuse me, oil futures will kind of land. Um, you know, I've spoken a lot of times on this show about uh, there, there are so many countries at the West uh, embargoes, essentially, um, regarding oil. And it's always interesting to see how that oil still gets out, right? And of course, this isn't usually factored into these kind of prices and, uh, you know, how much this kind of illegal oil, quote unquote, uh, impacts the price. It's probably negligible. Um, Regardless, there was just a, uh, I thought it was interesting since we always speak about it on here. Uh, you know, Iran uh, has a very hard time selling its oil around the world. And it's, uh, I've spoken about the shadow ships that exist, you know, that ship Venezuelan oil. Um, and it turns out that a, a Greek tanker um, was just caught uh, exporting Iranian oil. And they're getting fined uh, quite a bit. It had about 2 million barrels of Iranian oil. Again, that doesn't impact, you know, really the price of these futures here. Obviously, since that's more of like a black market kind of deal, but it's still interesting to see just kind of, uh, I mean, as it stands now and as it has for a long time, yeah, you know, the world runs on oil. And uh, as the book Dune says, the spice must flow and the oil must flow as well. And there's always going to be a way to kind of uh, to get this commodity out to other countries. And I don't know, I think it's just kind of interesting to see how uh, how the black market kind of works with stuff like that. Some other big news, obviously with the bonds acting kind of strange. The, I saw a lot of people on Twitter actually were taking a long position of the TLT. And that came on some interesting uh, kind of news that people took as a bottoming of it. Um, obviously, we're not doing too poorly right now. Uh, 94.12. See, we're on a two-week. On the monthly. I think... There might still be a bottom to be made in this, right? You had really strong service sector uh, kind of, uh, you know, data coming out, which shows that there might be some level of, like, sticky inflation going on. Um, of course, there was some kind of, not necessarily dovish, but not necessarily hawkish uh, communication from Powell at Jackson Hole also. Uh, um, 
I, I think with the increase in oil prices, and this is something, I, again, I was always saying, especially when CPI data comes out, um, that this is going to be, a, that's going to be a major driver of uh, inflation. And so we might still see rate hikes to come. I'm not sure if we're out of the woods yet on it, um, but regardless, I, I think there may still be a bottom to be made in, uh, in TLT. Moving on, Tesla is giving back some of the gains from the other day, down about 2.89% pre-market. Still dynamic, still trading in that bounds that we've been looking at on the yearly. Nothing new with that. That's setting up for lower price. The DXY trading at 105 right now, pretty substantial, especially coming back. I mean, we see it July 14th, I mean, trading at 99. That was letting the market rip during that time. We've had a really steady climb up, a little bit of a back down, and then, and then massive, massive bars to the upside here. The QQQ down 1.18% pre-market. Google down marginally, Meta down marginally. Disney uh, in that kind of embattled situation with Spectrum. We'll get to speaking about that a little bit as well. Apple is certainly interesting. And, you know, we've been having a lot, uh, essentially what's shaping up to be kind of a tech war with China. Uh, we banned Huawei devices, um, certainly among government officials in the U.S. Um, we stopped them from getting some of the chip tech that the West develops, uh, even though they get kind of younger, gener or excuse me, older generations of that. Of course, they had a major breakthrough, Huawei did, um, with some of their chip tech. China Today just banned uh, Apple phone usage among government employees. Uh, obviously, China is a substantially large market for Apple. And uh, this, is, this is a bar down on, on pretty significant volume. I mean, you're trading, what, at the highest right now on this bar? And this is on a daily, 188, all the way down to about 182, something roughly around there. And that was something I was always concerned about, too. You know, there's, there's always consequences with this. And I think the U.S. is kind of in a tough spot, right? Because I don't think they anticipated such a large leap in uh, chip technology with China. And maybe that should have been kind of expected because, uh, I mean, you know, they have all of our tech a lot of times, right? At least consumer-wise. I mean, obviously, they all have Apple phones. There might be a pivot with Apple into India. India is another really large, I mean, I think they're the largest population on Earth. And they're still developing in, in quite a substantial way. And looking to them as being kind of like a new... Um, you know, a new market where China is kind of closing off might be an interesting pivot. And so we'll see in the coming months kind of how Apple decides to move into that. India obviously has a lot of their own kind of proprietary products that they sell to their people. Um, they've actually done quite a fantastic job of, of being sustaining uh, regarding um, different tech and products. Uh, there's a lot of Indian companies that exist and that innovate as well uh, for their, their people. So let's take a look here. Um, you know, Disney's getting rocked pretty heavily. Uh, this is, they're having a dispute with Spectrum, essentially, for some kind of stream rights. And this is Disney urges their cable viewers to switch to its Hulu Plus service. Spectrum always has issues. They're, they're my internet provider, and I don't like a lot of things that they do. And I can talk a little bit more on that. Uh, folks, stay tuned. We have Kevin Hinks up next. We'll talk a little bit more about this uh, after his segment. Stay tuned. If you're looking for potential trading setups in the stock market, then Rocket Equities and Options Report is a newsletter you should try. Tommy O'Brien delivers options and equity trades when the markets present them using a combination of fundamentals and technicals. Sign up for Rocket Equities and Options Report today with a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. For all the details and to start your subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years 
years' experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. Steve Rhodes started his trading career as a student almost 20 years ago, and the student has now become the master. Steve won the prestigious Timer of the Year Award in 2018 and barely missed that mark again in 2019, finishing at number two for the year. An amazing accomplishment. Steve Rhodes is committed to sharing his techniques and knowledge with anyone who wants to learn, and he shares his vast amount of trading knowledge every day in his Mastering Probability newsletter. Steve's award-winning newsletter, Mastering Probability, is delivered every trading day with updates throughout the afternoon. Sign up for Steve's market newsletter, Mastering Probability, and you'll receive access to seven of Steve's educational webinars absolutely free. At TFNN, all our newsletters come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Visit TFNN.com and try Mastering Probability 30 days risk-free today. TFNN, education investors. TFNN has launched the Tiger's Den, hosted at Discord. TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no cash or added costs when you join our community of traders. Sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders. Just visit the front page of TFNN.com. Welcome back, folks. Uh, I believe we are joined by Kevin Hinks. Kevin, are you there? Yes. Good morning, Jacob. Hi. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Good. Just look, looking over some marks. It's a little headline trouble this morning. I think uh, China is trying to put some pressure on Apple. Yep. And put pressure on the group of companies they call the gatekeepers. Mm. It, it sounds like a chapter out of Atlas Shrugged, some of the comments right. <laughs> by, by these groups. But uh, it's pretty interesting. You've got, uh, you know, firm here up in the, the high 80s. You've got a dollar that is strong and, and, and showing no signs of backing off. Right. And you've got yields that are, you know, firm and bouncing. I, I'm surprised, frankly, that they're not higher this morning with the data we just got here at 7.30 Chicago time, 8.30 Eastern. The job of claim number was terror, was really strong at 216000 Productivity and cost, to sum it up, and significantly higher unit cost. So I think those have got some things out there. There's not a lot of top a lot of top tier earnings com coming out. Uh, you know, we'll void and the the market looks for uh, good news. Kevin, are you there? Might have lost Kevin momentarily. Let's wait a minute to see if we can uh, we can get Kevin back on the line. Um. What he's looking at is, yeah, so you have the gatekeepers. Obviously, these are like massive tech companies uh, in the U.S. You have Google as part of them, uh, Apple as well. Again, that's getting smacked pretty heavily today. Gold is doing is so interesting. Again, I, Dudette even said it in the, uh, this is one of the things I remarked at earlier, um, that it is strong today. It is strong today, even with a high dollar. And I think what's interesting about this, if I can pull up, uh, this article, and this is an analysis from J.P. Morgan. Give me one second while I go through everything. Oh, I think we have Kevin back on the line. Kevin, are you there? Yes, good morning. I'm back. Hey, sorry about that. I think we just had some uh, interruption there. No, no problem. 
So yeah, I, I wanna, I'm interested too what you're looking about with Apple, right? One of the things I was speaking about earlier is uh, obviously this is, this is a big hit to a massive consumer market that they have and how you think yeah. they might pivot in any capacity from this. Well, here, I think that China is trying to put some pressure on Apple. Right. Is this part of a large... Finally, maybe negotiated a way from the... Can I, the Wedbush analyst, he thinks it's only going to be about 500,000 phones. Okay. They're going to lose... When, 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 in essence, they sell 45 million phones in a year. Right, right, right. So a small drop in the bucket then. Yeah, exa- that, well, that's what he thinks. Now, the stock is reacting to this. You know, but it's I think I think we might have lost Kevin again. Yep, I'm sorry about that, guys. We'll, we'll see if we can try to get him back. There's, there's a lot of interference and just cutting in and out, um, which is a shame. Kevin always has such a, good, such a good input on this, and I always enjoy having him on when I'm filling in. We'll figure something out about that. Yeah, I, I hear you there, Dan. Kevin, are you there? I'm, I'm sorry about this. I'm not sure why we're having such interference. Yeah. Anyways... That's a shame. We'll, we'll try to see if we can get him back on. We can take a look at gold quickly. I know I was just speaking about that before we had him back on. Strong, high dollar. If you, if you are a subscriber of the Gold Report, Tom just had a subscriber webinar, and he spoke about what moves the gold market. Strong recommend, again, 30-day money-back guarantee if you're a first-time subscriber. I sit there and watch them, obviously. Uh... Really good information. There's a little bit of strange behavior because usually when you have a higher dollar, you get a little bit of a depressive movement in gold. We're not really seeing this. What does that say? Does it say gold is substantially strong? Does it say that the move in the dollar is not anticipated to be uh, long term? Is there going to be a retracing of this very quickly? It stands to see. But this is an article from Market Watch, and this is looking. Uh, on information from the J.P. Morgan strategist. And this is investor allocation to gold is at its highest level in 11 years. <laughs> I'm going to try to pronounce this name. It's a Greek. Strategist led by uh, Nicholas Panagetsoglu say the implied allocation to gold by non-bank investors has, led, has been led by central bank purchases. Derive data by dividing the stock of gold via coins, bars, or physical gold ETFs by the stock of financial assets. This is implied gold allocation by non-bank investors globally. And this is 2010 going back to, or going all the way up to 2023. And proxied by the stock of gold that is held for the investment purposes by central banks or private investors, holding gold via coins, bars, or physical gold ETFs. This is a percent of the stock of equities, so on you guys can read. Substantial uptick coming from 2016 at its lowest point. Quote-unquote investors' allocation to gold looks rather high by historical standards at the moment, and one needs to assume a structural increase in central bank demand beyond historical norms due to fear of sanctions or general diversification away from G7 government bonds, and that's to be bullish on gold. Uh, This is saying there's a problem with the story, and that the latest data from the World Gold Council covering the second quarter shows a normalization in central bank purchases. Okay, but there was a higher uptick substantially uh, beginning this year in that. This is a regression chart, and I'll post these charts at the end of the uh, show in the den, so stay tuned for that. And if you're not in the den, get in it. One dollar a year. Come on, guys. Central bank purchases do normalize, and gold may resume its historic relationship with the inflation-adjusted bond yields. Typically, each 100 basis point rise in the 10-year real yield results in a 209, and this is in uh, euros, uh, decline in the price of gold and vice versa. This was not the case last year. This is the last quote from that J.P. Morgan analyst. There is little doubt that the pace of central bank purchases holds the key to gauging the future trajectory of gold prices. It's a rise of 6% this year at 1943 an ounce, and that is today. Pretty interesting, I would say. Let's take a look at, well, AMC had some moves. This is bad news for all the apes out there, and this is just a strange 
they'll, they'll talk about this in like college lecture halls. But this deal with AMC, oh man. So the news, <laughs> they're gonna sell over 40 million shares. This is AMC Entertainment. Um, this was one of the big players in the meme stock era in Reddit. Um, you have a lot of these guys called apes. They, that, that term for those uninitiated is uh, you just buy at least all of your portfolio into AMC. It's usually a high purchase. I mean, this is nuts. We're trading all the way back down here to, let me see here, at its lowest, 844. There's a lot of people who got in like around these levels and everything. Folks, stay tuned, we'll be right back. The Gold Report. As a precious metal, gold is still king. It continues to hold the most effective safe haven and hedging properties across the global major trading hubs of the London OTC market, the U.S. futures market, and the Shanghai Gold Exchange. The Gold Report. Tom O'Brien publishes his weekly gold report every Monday morning for subscribers, consisting of coverage of the XAU, HUI, GDX, the dollar, bonds, the South African Rand, as well as 25 different mining equities with specific buy-sell recommendations. The Gold Report. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. Subscribe to Tom O'Brien's Gold Report newsletter now at TFNN.com. Currencies, commodities, and bond markets are as important as ever right now with how they're driving the volatility in equity markets across the globe, which is why it's a great time to try out Teddy Kegstat's Tiger Forex Report. Teddy Kegstat breaks down the Forex markets every Monday using his 30-plus years of experience as a trading veteran of futures, Forex, stocks, and options. Teddy releases his weekly Tiger Forex Report every Monday morning with coverage of all the major currency pairs, including the dollar index, the euro dollar, pound dollar, dollar Swiss, dollar yen as well as many more and he also has weekly coverage of the crude oil market and the 30-year t-bonds as they both influence forex markets tremendously when you sign up for the tiger forex report you also gain instant access to teddy's 60-minute webinar archive he just hosted forex strategies and fundamentals what is behind the tiger forex report for all the details and to start your 30-day tiger forex report subscription today visit the front page of tfnn.com tfnn educating investors Sharpening your skills as an investor is like getting better at playing a musical instrument. You have to practice, sure, but you also need excellent instruction from experts. At TFNN, you'll get advice and guidance from the authority in technical market analysis. And it's not just dry, tedious text either. TFNN airs live financial content streamed live on TFNN.com and TFNN's YouTube channel with Tiger TV. Live every market day from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern for free. Each host is an experienced trader and gives their take on the market while taking calls and questions live from around the world. From the moment the market opens until the closing bell sounds, Tiger TV has eight different shows with expert hosts to help you make the right moves with your money. Watch online at TFNN.com or on TFNN's YouTube channel and become the investor you were born to be. TFNN, educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. All right, welcome back, folks. We are talking about AMC before we went on the break. So they announced a plan to sell uh, 40 million shares, uh, take their stock pretty substantially. Um, they went through a one for 10 reverse stock split on August 24th. That's now nearing its lowest point since January 2021. So the, the fall extends the entertainment company's woes, it says, and then it slipped about 84% in the last 12 months and 68% since January, and now more than 73% this last quarter. And that really, like I said, this is gonna show an interesting era um, in stock history, you know, since COVID, there's been such wild moves and so many new people 
especially during quarantine, getting into stock trading and uh, these meme stocks are something else for sure. I mean, a lot of people are holding at uh, a loss right now, and they're going to be married to this stock, or even worse, they'll sell at uh, a loss regarding this. It's pretty interesting. Right, let's take a look. This is another super interesting. Uh, this, all right, we'll talk a little bit about this. Um, well, here, we'll read the, read the headline quickly, and I'll talk a little bit more on, on this kind of whole thing. Texas paid Bitcoin miner riot uh, 31.7 million to shut down during a heat wave in August, which is <laughs> insane. As a, all right, so what what goes on with this is you have a, you have a in order to create more Bitcoin, right? You have proof of work, okay? And there are these hashed algorithms that need to be solved. Um, so you use this is why GPUs were so expensive because GPUs run parallel um, kind of data processing, and this allowed for um, hashes to be solved. This created blocks of Bitcoin, essentially, and, that, and then therefore increased uh, the total supply. A lot of new crypto, um, especially with Ethereum, too, because they made the pivot, are now doing proof of work. So I have uh, some of that I know. Um, they have a building that they had purchased, and they just have a bunch of Bitcoin miners inside of there. Um, and so it just works on cracking and solving these kind of uh these kind of problems all day long. As the future of crypto moves forward, they're going to go towards more of a proof of stake. Um, so this kind of way of, of getting uh, crypto is going to go away. But regardless, Bitcoin is obviously uh, the number one, even though it is legacy, it is the number one uh, cryptocurrency out there. So this will continue for some period going forward. Uh, this is really <laughs> impressive. Um, so let's take a look here. During the crypto boom of 2021, Riot Platforms is raking in cash from Bitcoin mining. The company is losing so much money that it's counting on energy credits from selling back to the Texas grid to keep its costs under control. Riot said on Wednesday that it earned $31.7 million in energy credits last month from Texas power grid operator ERCOT. The company generated the credits by voluntarily curtailing its energy consumption during a record-breaking heat wave. The total value of the credits dwarfed the 333 Bitcoin the company mined in August, worth about $8.9 million at the end of uh, the month. August was a landmark month for Riot in showcasing the benefits of a unique power strategy. Okay, yeah, <laughs> sure. There, there's been a lot of interesting like talk on, on what to do with this. Uh, there was even conversation, I think, a few years ago with the governor of Wyoming trying to use like geothermal or nuclear in order to power Bitcoin mining as a source of income for the government. Um, but it's just, I don't know, I still think this is like really interesting and it just kind of underlines too, just this almost like voodoo transitional time we have in uh, the global economy, right? So, and yeah, obviously the price of these things, at least to generate them, is really tied heavily uh, to energy prices. The Electric Liability Council of Texas, and this is what ERCOT stands for, has a relatively simple and mutually beneficial agreement uh, excuse me, relationship with Bitcoin miners. The agency, uh, through established demand response programs, pays miners to reduce their power so as not to overstress the grid when the air conditioners need to run at full blast. In addition to the summer difficulties, ERCOT also failed during the fatal winter storm of early 2021. ERCOT has historically struggled with fluctuating energy prices and sporadic service, so it strikes deals with flexible energy buyers like crypto miners. The agency also counts on Bitcoin miners to soak up excess power when there's too much supply, keeping prices in check. How fascinating is that? <laughs> Texas made itself an ally to the Bitcoin mining industry through credits, but the financial incentives hit a snag in early 2023. A bill to cut off the mining industry from those credits, SB 1751, passed the Texas State Senate in April, but ultimately stalled out in House Committee. Super fascinating stuff. I'll read a little bit more about that after the show today, just because uh, I think it's kind of neat. Let's take a look as well. I have my headphone falling out. Give me a second. <laughs> All right, let's see. This is interesting, too. I was talking about um, insurance with people. My, my car insurance has gone up significantly. Um, I moved to St. Pete from another area um, in the county, and uh, they found me out, and they, they really raked up my energy costs. We're having a major move, and I, I see more and more every day, um, especially with an influx of people from other states, especially California or Colorado, 
Um, with electric vehicles, right? We obviously had a scare with Idalia, the uh, hurricane that just passed through that did cause some flooding. Um, you know, so one, let's just say, okay, you have an interesting thing that occurs when you have any kind of like disaster that happens, right? And there is some evidence that people will leave some of their older cars or cars they don't really care about or whatever, um, kind of in flood zones. And, and again, this is much more like there's some indicator that this occurs, right? Um, but there has been some uh, kind of study going on with it. And uh, these people will then file insurance claims, um, get some money, and then, you know, do whatever they want with it uh, going forward. Probably getting a nicer car or something like that. What's interesting about being in Florida, and we're having all these people from out of state move in, uh, from maybe more, you know, progressive um, states regarding uh, electric vehicles, um, is that we're going to see maybe an uptick, too, in kind of these claims. And so this is a big issue that occurs with Teslas and other lithium-ion uh, kind of focused cars, electric vehicles in general. Exposed to salt water, they can catch on fire. This is kind of old news, but I still think it's interesting, too. And another hurdle uh, that this country is going to have to make uh, moving towards some of these more greener technologies. Um, so, yeah, the floodwaters here could cause their cars to suddenly burst into flames. If you own a hybrid or electric car uh, that has come into contact with salt water due to recent flooding within the last 24 hours, it's crucial to relocate the vehicle from your garage without delay. And this is a department uh, said in the Facebook post, salt water exposure can trigger combustion in lithium ion batteries. If possible, transfer your vehicle to higher ground. The warning also applies to electric golf carts, scooters, bicycles with lithium ion batteries, potentially sparking a fire when they get wet. Uh, more specifically, salt residue remains after the water dries out and can create bridges uh, between battery cells. So they share um, ions between the battery cells, uh, potentially creating electrical connections that can spark fires. This was a big thing that happened last year in Fort Myers as well uh, with the hurricane. And we, we saw a massive uptick in claims as well from that. Now, granted, that was a very uh, miserable hurricane for a lot of people in that area. So anyways, we'll see how we kind of like deal with that going forward. As I always say, you can never quite know the future. Looking a little bit here, um, Lockheed Martin doing quite well. They're trimming the delivery outlook for F-35 stealth jets. And I've always liked these defense, tech, uh, defense sector stocks uh, because there's always a business for it, for better or for worse. And whether that's organic or not, uh, we'll look a little bit more uh, at this story and the stock as well when we get back. Folks, stay tuned. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Will the S&P 500 continue to climb? For bold trades on U.S. large cap stocks in either direction, trade SPXL, SPUU, or SPXS. Direction's daily S&P 500 bull and bear leveraged ETFs. Direction leveraged ETFs. An investor should carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risks, charges, and expenses before investing. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus contain this and other information about Direction shares. To obtain a fund's prospectus and summary prospectus, call 866-476-7523 or visit directioninvestments.com. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus should be read carefully before investing. An investment in the funds is subject to risk, including the possible loss of principal. The funds are designed to be utilized only by sophisticated investors such as traders and active investors. Distributor Foresight Fund Services, LLC. 
TFNN has just launched their new trading room, the Tiger's Den. Hosted at Discord, TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. And now they are expanding their reach with the Tiger's Den. Available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. In the Tiger's Den, you can look over the shoulders of Tom O'Brien and the other TFNN hosts while they analyze charts during their live Tiger TV programs and join an interactive trading community with hundreds of members exchanging ideas. Interact with other Tigers and Tigresses as they share trading ideas, news analysis, and discuss the market action all trading day, even at night and on the weekends. The Tigers Den at Discord is accessible on mobile or tablets as well, so it's always at your reach. To sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders, just visit the front page of TFN nn.com This program is brought to you by Vista Gold, traded on the NYSE American and TSX under the symbol VGZ. Welcome back, folks. We are about uh, 12 minutes out from the, or 12 minutes into the opening of the day. Pretty interesting tick up in the Dow right now. Um, give it a little bit of time, see what happens with that. We are uh, a little bit uh, sideways down in the ES Mini, sideways down in the Russell, uh, sideways down in the NQs, gold sideways as well. Maybe another one of those days. Too early to tell. Tesla recovering a little bit think <laughs> we'll see how they do as well and apple really cooking at that down three percent all right let's take a look back at lockheed martin they had uh quite the dip recently and this wasn't extending out some of their new updated tech into 2024 that doesn't really show it I'm just looking at things at the yearly just to see how it goes so quite a substantial drop from 440 uh down to the 425 area so let's take a look here. This is their new hottest thing. And some of their quarterlies weren't solid as well. Um, their backlog wasn't as poor as it was the uh, fiscal year prior, um, but they still were having a little bit of issues. Um, so this is Lockheed Martin is saying in a regulatory filing that it now expects to deliver 97 jets in 2023, and that's down from the previous forecast between 100 and 120 jets. The company expected to deliver the first F-35 with a technology refresh upgrade in 2023, uh, but it now expects the first upgraded jets to be delivered between April and June 2024. This is a quote from the company, as a result, we now expect to deliver 97 aircraft in 2023, and that's a TR2 configuration. The TR3 is their, you know, again, their new updated kind of systems, uh, which we do not currently anticipate will impact our 2023 financial outlook. Let's see here, I want to see the part where it's, this, and this is the number one thing. Oh, come on, where is that? Anyways, the point is, is they're pushing out some of their, their newer stuff into 2024 when they announced they were going to be doing it in 2023, which is not good looks for the company. Again, I don't know. Is this a, is this a point to buy? They're a solid company and have been for eons. Uh, they are totally um, a substantial part of the mosaic that makes up the you know military industrial uh, complex that occurs, um, which is, you know I guess, good business in some capacity. So it's interesting to watch what happens with that. And it's interesting to see them, too, having such a substantial kind of glut, which is what's going on. So I'll take a look at that, too, as, like, the week goes on, um, as I come back and fill in for Tommy or Steve or anything like that. We'll take a look, too, at Roku. They're laying off about 10% of their staff. And people love that. People love when companies do that as well. Obviously, we had a big run-up on some volume coming back down as well. 85. I think we had lowest this year, at least, around this level. Um, you know, coming back to volume on this, I'm not sure. You have like a head and shoulders thing going on here, or a reverse one of that. Um, yeah, this is interesting, actually. I mean, you had a really big sell. I mean, this might be people kind of getting out of this area. I don't know what to make of this, actually, right now. 
you know, you have big volume on this massive leg up. If we back down, I guess we'll have to wait to see what it does today. Let me take it on the daily. Yeah, just some more down sideways movement, at least right now here. Fascinating. They laid off 10% of the workforce. That's soaring it higher last Wednesday. Roku said in addition to the layoffs, uh, it would slow the pace of hiring, consolidate office space, reduce its outside services, and perform a strategic review of its content portfolio to save money. And that's the name of the game right now. I always say what's so interesting with Meta, you get this massive tick up. And it's always because they're uh, cutting something that they had overextended themselves into. This is just general kind of housekeeping for Roku, but this is really one of the main drivers that will like send stocks so much higher. And we haven't seen a lot of that, too, in recent years. So this shows, you know, obviously a kind of like a new, like, phasal shift in uh, some of the larger companies as well. Obviously, that's to be expected with such high interest rates and kind of restriction on uh, so much excess cash. This is Roku's third round of layoffs in under a year. The company cut 200 jobs in both March 2023 and 2022, respectively. Uh, the company expects to incur restructuring charges of $45 million to $65 million. But even as it eliminates the positions of hundreds of workers, Roku said that it would bring in more money than previously expected. The company's new third quarter forecast anticipates revenues between $835 million and $875 million, up from the previous estimates of uh, $815. In a recent letter to shareholders, Roku executives expressed worries over an economic environment that constitutes uh, to create uncertainty. Excuse me. Huh. Continues to create uncertainty and warned that the writers and actor strikes in the U.S. would hurt media entertainment spending. Still, I'm going to go buy a new Roku. I need to. Mine is aging, and uh, I just love the service that they have. Every cafe that I go to that has uh, movies being shown or anything else uses a Roku as well, and I just see that as being um, such a big titan. I'm going to take a look here. Where is it? This is some international news, but I find it super interesting, and I know it kind of just ties into this general, like, you know, everything that's going on with global inflation. Um, this country is not really a big player in any capacity, but I just think, you know, from a, like, a global economics perspective, which I think, you know, even if you're doing day trading and everything like that, I still think it's important to kind of, like, know what's going on globally, and everything has some kind of strange butterfly effect. What I'm looking at here, and this is <laughs> this is such a strange move, and I'll look at this chart here, I and mean, maybe I'll throw over the article, but it's this is Poland Central Bank, and they're cutting interest rates <laughs> ahead of the election. And I mean, talk about like a short-sighted decision. They have pretty intense inflation over there. And they're lowering their central bank interest rate, 75 basis points to 6% before the October poll. The National Bank of Poland surprised markets on Wednesday with a steep cut in its benchmark interest rate, changing course on monetary policy ahead of other central banks. And this is what's so interesting about these kind of like smaller countries that don't necessarily fit into the, uh, of course, every country fits into the global fabric. Um, but, you know, Poland's a major player in any capacity. And you see with these other small countries too, like for instance, like El Salvador, right? And there are great little case studies of, like, what if. And I think we should, again, I think we should all be interested in kind of these more economic forces, even if we're just doing, you know, technical trading on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but this is like a fascinating move by them. Um, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out, right? Polish inflation is, like, double digits right now. Not good for them. And it, so, I mean... They'll obviously run probably on the perspective that, hey, listen, we're lowering interest rates. We're fine. You know, I don't know how they're anticipating to spend themselves out of this because that's not how this works at all. But uh, who's to say? It'll be interesting to see how that develops. I thought that was just some interesting news. So another really large uh, kind of information, this is from Investopedia. It's saying that some banks were underreporting uninsured deposits. And that's from the FDIC, and this is kind of massive as well. The uninsured deposits for those that exceed the 250,000 FDIC insurance limit uh, played a key role in this year's banking turmoil. We'll talk a little bit more about that. I know we only have a short uh, segment after this, but folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back on this. The goal.
Gold Report. As a precious metal, gold is still king. It continues to hold the most effective safe haven and hedging properties across the global major trading hubs of the London OTC market, the U.S. futures market, and the Shanghai Gold Exchange. The Gold Report. Tom O'Brien publishes his weekly gold report every Monday morning for subscribers, consisting of coverage of the XAU, HUI, GDX, the dollar, bonds, the South African Rand, as well as 25 different mining equities with specific buy-sell recommendations. The Gold Report. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. Subscribe to Tom O'Brien's Gold Report newsletter now at TFNN.com. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com. Educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. Welcome back, folks. Uh, I was kind of just like... Well, you have to laugh sometimes at the absurdity of things, right? Because if you don't do that, you're kind of in a bad spot. And I just, I'm not going like, to hang on this for too long at all. Um, but, but yeah, basically the headline on this, uh, banks are underreporting on insured deposits. The FDIC says, uh, the FDIC said that certain banks are not reporting uninsured deposits in accordance with the instructions to the consolidated reports of conditioned income. It's like, guys, what are we doing? In particular, the agency singled out the practice of banks excluding uninsured deposits backed by collateral, leading banks to understate the total amount of uninsured deposits. Under the FDIC's instructions, obviously banks must report all uninsured deposits, and those are deposits in accounts over $250,000. <laughs> obviously, this is from SVB, Signature Bank, First Republic. Good job. Like, I mean, come on, right? Um, this is interesting. I'll just read this really quickly, and this is also more fresh. The regional banks may need to sell $63 billion in bonds under this rule. Uh, U.S. regional banks may need to raise significant amounts of additional debt to comply with new regulatory requirements, but the extra capital might not be enough to prevent future failures, according to the research published Wednesday. 18 regional lenders might need $63 billion of new holding company debt to comply with the rules of the FDIC, um, the Federal Reserve, and the officer of comptroller of the currency, according to a note by Bloomberg intelligence analysts. Okay, what a mouthful. The regulations were drafted by three agencies to safeguard financial institutions. Under the new rules, banks with $100 billion of assets or more 
will need to issue enough long-term debt to cover capital losses in times of severe stress. Again, this wouldn't be an issue if they just laddered their uh, receivables. I, it, it was really insane to see what happened with uh, the banking system, especially the regional banking system earlier this year, or particularly the regional banking system. Um, regional banks with more than 250 billion of assets may need uh, to have set, or excuse, excuse me, may have 17 billion bail-in debt shortfall. Uh, Mid-sized regional banks with 100 billion to 250 billion of assets uh, may also become more active debt issuers to tackle their potential debt shortfall of 46 billion. Super fascinating. I'm going to link this in the den right now, folks. Thank you so much uh, for tuning in. You know, Tommy's out of town for a little while, so I'll be with you um, for the time to come. Stay tuned.